we should lay out and be intentional about laying out a different set of ideas that takes our nation in a very different direction and win people over to those ideas. So thanks for those of y'all that are engaged in this. I'm gonna have to cut my uh, comments short. Uh, and I, I appreciate Julie, you doing the introduction. I know you've got great stuff that I'm not gonna get a chance to be able to hear. I'm on my way to Tulsa. Obviously there's multiple meetings that are obviously happening there. That would be with other members of law enforcement. Thanks again to law enforcement for all of our first responders. It is amazing to me how many times people see something on the news and they'll see things on the news and they'll realize, okay, the news got there last. Okay, there were folks that were along there before that. So thanks for all of you that were along there before that uh, to be able to engage. So I'm going to get a chance to be able to sit down with some of those folks and to be able to see what we can do to help, where we're going, what needs to be done. And so there's certain shift change times and everything else. I've got to hit some hard de deadlines to be able to be there. So I apologize for cutting things short on it. My, my goal today was really just to say thanks for what you continue to do. Uh, there's, I look around the room, there's not many strangers uh, in this room. There are a few, few faces I don't recognize, but a lot of faces that I do, just from being around Barlow so many times in so many places, and seeing you so engaged across our state. So I just want to be able to say thanks for doing that from Cindy and I both. Uh, I would also be remiss uh, if I didn't say as well, June the 28th, I expect all of you to vote. Okay. Uh, I would appreciate if, if I was one of those black marks that you would make uh, next, to, next to that ballot as well. But I anticipate all of us that are going to vote and go encourage other people to be able to vote as well. Cindy and I are always shocked when people say to us, I look forward to voting for you in November. Like, this is like a, a two-stage thing, okay? You got to do the first one before you get to the second one on it. And so few people in our state actually vote in primary. So encourage your neighbors, get them to actually get out and get a chance to be able to vote and participate. And uh, so proud of you for actually doing that. Let me give you a couple of things just in DC of some things that are going on. One is people are not talking about, and it's immigration. I serve on the Homeland Security Committee. In fact, God willing, Republicans win back the majority in November. I'll be the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee starting in January. Yeah. <laughs> There are lots of things happening at the border that the national media has just stopped talking about. Soon I have people catch us all the time and say, things must be going back to the border no one's talking about anymore. I just smile and go, no, the national media just moved on. Remember last summer when there were those horrible things that we were seeing last summer and the mass crowds and all that was happening on the southern border? That's when we had 6,000 people a day illegally crossing the border last summer. We now have 8,000 people a day illegally crossing the border. Last month, we had a quarter million people illegally cross the border last month. That's the highest month ever. The previous record was the month before. So no, the numbers are not getting better. They continue to be able to get worse. I was down in Yuma, Arizona this past weekend, where it's a fabulous 107 degrees right now. <laughs> so I was down in Yuma, Arizona in that area. Every border crossing area is a little bit different than what you actually see there and how they're trying to be able to manage it. Yuma is either first or second highest number of illegal crossings each month. It's usually between the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas and Yuma, Arizona back and forth. But they're very different. What's happening in Rio Grande Valley are folks are coming in those long caravans coming in from Central America. If you come to Yuma, Arizona, it's very different. In Yuma, Arizona, Individuals from all over the world are flying to Mexicali, Mexico, getting a charter bus that the cartel charters for them, pick them up at the airport, will drive them to the gap in the fence that Biden has left there, the gap in the fence, and will drop them off at the gap. They'll get off the bus with their luggage, cross, step across the border, and stand there and wait for the border patrol vans to come pick them up like their Uber. And so they'll just stand there and wait, and literally look at their watch like, what's taking them so long? Border Patrol vans pick them up, take them to the processing center. When I talked to the Border Patrol folks last week on this last weekend on it, I asked how many countries have crossed the crossing in Yuma this year? One of the guys there, he said, well, I can't tell you this past year, but I'm the one in charge of actually running that number. I go pull that for you, but I just turned in for last week. Last week, we had people from 50 different countries that crossed at this crossing. Wow. 50 at that crossing. When I was in the processing area stationed there, uh, one of the Border Patrol agents, she walked up to me. She said, you see the lady right behind you? And I turned around and looked. She goes, I said, yes. She said, she's wearing a Versace dress. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those 50 countries that just illegally crosses the border. 
These are folks coming in with wealth, with money, with their families, they're just crossing the border, and they're coming into the country because Biden has opened the border so much, you can either go through the legal process, which will take years, or you can pay the cartel, and they will drive you up to the border and you're in. Right now, as you cross the border, the Biden, uh, the Biden administration's instructed Border Patrol, when they get there, to be able to ask folks if they're pleading asylum, which everyone does, they cross the border because the cartels instruct them on what to say. They cross the border and say, I have credible fear in my country, that's the code word. And they'll say, okay, you can pick any city you want to make your fear claim in America. Pick anywhere you want to go. And then once they pick their city, then they'll get their paperwork and their hearing is set for eight years in the future. I wish I was kidding me. Eight years in the future, you get your hearing. In the meantime, you've got a work permit. So they literally are able to come to the country, cross illegally. Eight years in the future is when they're hearing and they have a work permit. Why would you go through the legal process to be able to go through a visa request when you could literally pay the cartels, walk through the gap in the fence, and get an eight-year work permit into the United States of America, the greatest country in the world? Biden keeps saying they're going to go after root causes of immigration, of illegal immigration. The folks in Central America, the leaders there, will call me and will say point blank, the root cause of illegal immigration are the Biden policies enticing my people to leave my country and come to the United States to work. They're mad at us in Central America because some of their best laborers are leaving their economy their economies are collapsing in Central America because they're leaving out from there to come to the United States where they can make more money. And Central America's economies are collapsing. The root cause of the economic issues in Central America is Joe Biden. That's the root cause. So the challenge that we've got is to be able to confront this and to be able to get the Biden administration to do their job. And there are practical ways that they can't actually implement it to do it. And I'm going to continue to be able to hammer on those things over and over and over again uh, to be able to continue to be able to push on that. The other issue is energy policy. All of us feel it. All of us. The Biden administration, I'll, I'll do this illustration for you real quick. This is what the Biden administration is doing. Okay. Their, their energy production policy is they're saying the energy companies produce more energy, but when they try to, they find out you can't get a permit for it. So let me take two areas. Gulf of Mexico, 24%, by the way, of the oil and gas that we use come from federal lands and waters. So it's significant. We produce on, on private lands here in Oklahoma. The 24% of the energy we use is, is from federal lands and waters. So offshore, they're saying, we've given you leases. You need to go produce on those. But when you actually try to go, the Commerce Department has already announced they're not allowing any more seismic testing in the Gulf of Mexico, they would permit on the seismic because they don't want to disturb marine mammals. And so no one's going to do any kind of offshore drilling until they can actually do the seismic to determine is this the right spot to go. So they've given them the lease, but they won't allow them to do the seismic testing. That's one example. Onshore, they've opened up leasing. You'll hear the Biden administration say, well, we've opened up new leasing for onshore, just no one's using the leases because these greedy energy companies they just want to run the prices up and make it uh, and limit up the supply. When in actuality, when you look at the leases that they've opened up, they're island leases that are separated from other leases. Why would that matter? You can't get a pipeline there. Right. If you produce on that lease, you can't get the energy out. So they're literally opening up leases on shore that they know no one's gonna actually use. So they can say, we opened up leases for permitting and those greedy energy companies just don't want to take it. They're continuing to be able to cut off access to pipelines and uh, refuse to allow more pipeline permitting on interstate permitting. This is the issue. Our energy prices are pretty straightforward. It's a supply and demand issue. If we don't get more supply, we're going to continue to face high prices on this. So we are continuing to be able to confront the administration, and we are winning some of these fights. FERC is an entity you've never heard of, but they do a lot of the natural gas permitting for pipelines, for exports, for everything else on it. The FERC uh, group made a decision to basically lock out new pipelines in America. They basically made the rules so nebulous, no one would put their capital at risk because they have no idea what kind of decision FERC's gonna make. We called them in front of our committee, all five of the FERC members, just briefed them out, talking about the consequences of everything else on it, to be able to walk through all the different issues. Three weeks after that hearing, they rescinded their rule and said, never mind. We're making progress in these areas. 
but every single stage of it is a fight. And the Biden administration is determined America's gonna turn to all electric vehicles and they're gonna drive the price up and make it hard long term to be able to get to afford a gasoline powered anything or a diesel powered anything. And that is their vehicle to try to push you to electric vehicles. Even in their numbers, it is a minimum of 30 years to be able to get there. A minimum of 30 years to be able to get there. But they feel like they can accelerate people moving to this, but at the same time, they won't allow mining for lithium, so they're gonna make us dependent on China for any kind of battery, at the same time that they're driving up the price of oil and gas. So we're trying to bring common sense to this. Why does it matter when we win the House and the Senate, and we are gonna win the House and the Senate in yeah. November? still have life in the White House. Number one is, if we win the House and when we win the House, all these things like Build Back Better and everything that have been driving up inflation won't even come up. They won't even come up because constitutionally, all revenue has to start in the House. So Biden can't have Pelosi do his bidding to be able to bring up these big massive bills. That's not gonna happen when we win the House. Why does it matter when we win the Senate? The Senate does personnel and policy both. That means on the personnel side, we, we can actually take some of these nominees that Biden is sending over that he's winning on a 50-50 vote in the Senate because he's got the swing vote of Kamala Harris uh, there to be able to win it. Those nominees no longer get a hearing either. If Biden sends over some of these crazy nominees to us that want to actually wreck our economy rather than improve our economy, we just say we're not going to do a hearing on those. You've got to send us common sense votes. Now, we're not going to agree on everything, but if you don't send us common sense votes, we're not going to even hear them. It changes dramatically the folks that actually go into the administration that are running the regulatory schemes behind the scenes. It matters when we win this election long term for our economy, for what's going on, and what's happening in social policy. This president is the most pro-abortion president in American history. He is doing everything he can to increase the number of abortions in America. It is unbelievable to me. It used to be they would say safe, legal, and rare, now they just say legal. That's it, they just say legal. We want abortion to be legal. They no longer say rare, they no longer even say safe. Just legal. We're doing everything we can to push back on this. Our state leadership has done a great job on that, on making it very clear that we <laughs> We in Oklahoma believe every child is valuable. We don't think some children are disposable and some children are valuable. We think every child's valuable. Now the media in DC and my colleagues on the left in DC, they go nuts on this. They call me a radical. I'm the most pro-life member of the Senate. I lead the values action team. I actually push all members towards their pro-life policies and continue to be able to drive these issues because I just believe children are valuable. I get called radical and extremist all the time on and it just makes me laugh. And so I, I don't take offense to it. When people call me a radical to my face on it, I'll say, okay, so let me get this straight. I believe every child is valuable and I'm a radical. You treat some children as medical waste and you say you're not radical. I think that's radical <clears throat> to treat a child with 10 fingers and 10 toes and a beating heart and a functioning nervous system that has DNA that's different than the mom and different than the dad, that's a unique person that's there. I want to treat that person as a person. I don't think that's radical by any means. But I think we can continue to be able to win people over in the argument when we continue to be able to make the argument. We're now making the argument where it should be. It's not about the convenience of the adults. It's about the value of that child. That's where the argument needs to be, and that's where it's landing. Now, I believe the Supreme Court's about to, in the next several weeks, put out their final opinion to be able to take out Roe v. Wade entirely. That doesn't end abortion in America. That takes it to every single state and to the federal level as well to be able to determine it. It takes it back to the legislatures where it should have been all along so we can actually have that fight there. Our state's already spoken on this. Colorado is going to do abortion tourism. They just are. They're going to say you can't get abortion in Oklahoma, come to one of our resorts, we'll do a special deal if you're getting a, an abortion here. They're going to do abortion all the way up until the day of delivery in Colorado. The reason I bring that up to you is this. There is a sense that we'll just solve this nationally. We're not. We've got to work on two things. Making abortion illegal, but also making abortion unthinkable. 
that's continuing to encourage and bless and love on moms and dads that are afraid, that are saying, this is going to be terribly inconvenient in my stage of life. Let's just end their life. To actually bring to those folks the value of that child and who that child is. So I've heard folks say, our crisis pregnancy centers will be obsolete. No, that's not true. We're going to have to continue to be able to double even our efforts to speak out to the value of that child. Because there'll still be moms in Oklahoma that'll be afraid. And they'll say, I just need to go to Colorado. We need to keep loving on those moms. We need to keep bringing truth to them and continue to be able to speak out. I believe if we fast forward 50 years from now, I believe we will look back on a season in America where there was abortion on demand, like we look back on the time of women's suffrage in the time of when we declared as a country, certain people are three-fifths of a man. We're appalled by those things in our history. And we look back on it and say, I can't believe there was ever a time that we declared some people three-fifths of a man. I can't believe there was ever a time we wouldn't allow women to vote. We look back at that season of our history and go, gosh, what were we thinking? I think 50 years from now, that generation will look at this generation and say, they used to take the lives of children because they were inconvenient. And they'll be appalled by this season. So in this season that ran a transition, let's go love on moms. Let's go challenge dads and men to be responsible. Let's go continue to be able to walk side by side with families because though we'll clear abortion from our state, we've still got a big national job to do to be able to put the message out that every child is valuable. <clears throat> so I say that to you to say, keep going. There's not only a political thing that we need to do, there's a moral thing that we've got to continue to be able to do to be able to speak out to them. So I've got to run. I've got to get to this meeting there. Thank you for your engagement. I would be honored to have your vote on the 28th of June. But really, thanks so much for what you continue to be able to do for our state. God bless y'all.